I thought it might be easier. But do you want me to wear this? Yeah, it gives you both, doesn't it? So we can hear you as well as them. Oh, okay. He only cares about his studio audience. True. Mm -hmm. You can click. Is it which one? That one. Are we on? You're now on. It's that button, yeah. That's that one. Yeah. Cool. Let's go. Keep left, left off, and not flying solo. Good morning. Did you all have a good night last night? Yeah, yeah happy days. Um, so I wasn't going to give this talk today, but I was talking at the pub about um, a talk I actually gave at iOSDEV UK now three, four years ago, um, all about UX. And somebody asked me if I would repeat it, so we talked about it, and I said, yeah, why not? We'll do that. Um, so the talk I'm actually going to give today is, um, is all about UX from the perspective of this man. This is Simon Cowell. Um, if you don't know who Simon Cowell is, I don't know where you've been for the last like 10 years, um, but he's involved with this show. This is The X Factor. Everyone watch The X Factor? No, obviously not. <laughs> um, so I'm going to argue that Simon Cowell is a master of UX. He is better than anybody in this room. He knows his audience better than anyone. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate that by looking at what's happened in the X Factor during um, some of the, the, the years of the, the competition. So back in 2013, Sam Bailey won the X Factor. And I don't think this was an accident. I think this was a predetermined feat that Simon Cowell engineered. So let's look at Sam Bailey's vote share across the weeks of the X Factor. So it's, it's fairly split. Obviously, it goes up towards the end. She won it in week 11. Um, but actually, there's some really interesting points on this graph. So let's like, take a look, first of all, at week number two. So in week number two, Sam, so Sam sang Make You Feel My Love, and she sang in front of an hourglass timer. As you can see there, her time is almost running out. And in that week, surprise, surprise, she got her lowest share of the vote. She got 17.4% um, of, of the vote, which was her lowest week during the competition. So let's look at where she got a better share of the vote. So we're going to ignore the last week. We're going to uh, look at her second best week other than the last week, which was week seven when she sang Bleeding Love. That week, she was stood on top of a winner's podium. She looked like a winner. She was clearly going to win the X Factor. And yes, she got 36% of the vote. Ignoring the last week, that was her highest percentage. Now, you might think that that was a coincidence, that that only happened once, but no. Let's take a look at this. This is Jay Quickendom. This was the week that he got voted off the X Factor. Um, you compare that to Lauren Platt. So the same week, Lauren Platt got the highest percentage of the vote, 12.7%, compared to Jay Quickendom's 4.8% of the vote. So Jake there, he sung in, front of, sang in front of a shattered mirror, shattered glass. He's clearly, clearly going home. Lauren Platt, she's sung in front of a, a messianic halo. What is going on? She cannot do a thing wrong. Um, <laughs> therefore, she obviously does very well in the competition. And she carries on through. I think she came third or fourth that year in the competition. So again, you might say that's a coincidence. But no, it's not. Let's look at this man here. This is Wagner. Wagner sang in the X Factor. And somehow, he managed to stay in the competition for a full eight weeks. Now, he did some very flamboyant performances. He was a very good performer. Um, but actually, I think everybody would agree Wagner could not be allowed to win the X Factor. So therefore, we had the judges' assassination. And it really was the assassination. So in the week, week eight, the week of the assassination, he sang, I'm a creep, I'm a weirdo. What the hell am I doing here by Radiohead? If that was not enough... Danny Minogue said, you really connected with those lyrics. <laughs> and then to really put the knife in, Simon Cowell, if people spend money on this, then you're entitled to be in the competition. So obviously, Wagner went out of the competition. There's other examples. Um, District 3. And they got the lowest uh, share of the vote in week six. That's the week they went home. Louis Walsh turned around and said, I just know people are going to vote for you. So they didn't. Um, versus Ella Henderson, Chulisa said, Ella is not safe. If you believe in Ella, now is the time to act. Um, and people did. She got a very high percentage of the vote that week. So why is this relevant to us? Let's take a look at this error message in iOS. Uh, Cordova Facebook Connect plugin fails on auth.status. That is a very unhelpful error message. It does not help our users. It does not encourage our users to use our apps. Compare that to something like, 
the mail server I'm at, the gmail.com, is not responding. Verify you have entered the correct account information and settings. Here, we've given the user something to do. We've given them an error message, yes, something's went wrong, and we've said, go away and do something about it. This is something you can do to help yourself. If we do that, that allows us to get to know our users better than the users know themselves. It means we can give users something to do, we can engage with them, and hopefully get them to have more fun using our apps and actually not just go away and not do something. Um, really important, user research, design, build, whatever. That's Simon Cowell, and that's the UX Factor. Thank you very much. Said hello to us, you'd have had enough time. <laughs> Remember, if you want to vote for Steve, it's <laughs> <laughs> one oh one oh. I'll just serve I don't know what happened to the Everybody last can see the timer except the person no, giving the talk. Oh, yeah, you can just. And it goes red. Right, cool. Have one of those. Is that the full slide? Yeah. So the main feature, apart from the model of the, the site itself, is the timeline feature across the bottom, which lets you choose between the reconstructions and the kind of options menu. Uh, the options on that menu are very high, obviously, but you can think of another way of doing it. So that here, the user has chosen to, to see the artifacts. And if you look fairly closely here, there's a, there's a brown bolt, I'm almost certain that we can see, but there, which is a, an accent left lying at the site. If the user taps on that, During interruptions, the IR tracking stops. Uh, but we found that didn't work very well. It's just not precise enough, uh, which kind of does away with the problem with Wi Fi and the device. 
bus is not having GPS. And obviously we have the pragmatic problems. We have distance, it's a long way to go and test. It's also a lot of websites are working with Swift, but I have to tell them that they aren't. The last big learning curve for me as well. Thank you. I know the most interesting talk. to hack uh, with the UI kit header files, it's so simple. Not everything works, storyboard's not going to work, zip's not going to work, some constraints will fail, and the whole thing will crash, freeze, and fail violently on you, but it's still coming. I mean, what could go possibly wrong? Right? This? But the explosion is not that big, so, I mean, even though this can happen, we still do it because it's cool and we do it for science. Thank you. 
slash Jersey Act, and people can make it for this year. I thought um, I won't be doing much technical anymore. I'm pretty much on the, on the management side now. So I'm going to do this sort of management talk. Also, I can realize that um, the last girls have been around for a good while since I said, you've been around the block a few times, Chris, which I thought was an interesting way to describe it. I just thought, why am I still alive? That's the good. <laughs> so I've, uh, I've worked in lots of teams, I've led a few teams. But I'm wondering why it's, uh, some teams seem to sort of be really effective, some teams just kind of to just leave a team for a team like this job or an evening somewhere else. And I went um, to a couple of conferences this year, saw some people speak, and I thought, well, that might be it. So I've been um, sort of done the best slides and uh, talking a bit rather than an interview now. So um, this is what I always thought we needed from great team, and I think it's what most people need. We kind of get really fantastic people to go We stick them in the room, we shut the door, we do amazing things, and kind of six months later, deliver a fantastic product. Um, that did do this for quite a long time, I thought. It doesn't really matter what process you use, it doesn't matter how you treat people, that was so important. But as long as you've got really, really intelligent, bright people, that was just tough. Turns out, that's completely wrong. If you're lucky, it might work. But the IT would have to research, they looked at the people they interviewed, they looked at what the team was made up of, and they found out that actually, sort of personal or individual brilliance doesn't actually predict what your team is going to be like. Turns out what you want is that people can trust each other. So it might be a bit sloppy or a bit lame, but could you feel comfortable trying them for only a few years? How much do you trust them? How long do you think you'll be with them? If you make a mistake, are they going to help you? Or are they going to throw you under the bus? Do they act as a multiplier for you? Do they enhance your strengths? Or do they exploit your weaknesses? Time if you hold the team at night. <laughs> Have a diversity group of people in your team. Do they bring in different opinions, different kind of experience to the sort of development process? That's why Ashley makes a great team. So uh, this, this concept called psych psychological safety. The kind of environment where people can take risks, people can be themselves, people are able to suggest things without risk of being ridiculed, sort of making on your idea. Sometimes we come up with something which is great. Says, no, this, that's basically just you being a bit of it. That's what's appeared to me, but some people don't like that. You want to be the sort of nice people. Um, so, what do we see in teams that aren't sort of great? You know, I'm scared to make a mistake. You know, if something goes wrong, I need someone to blame. You know, I'd better stay quiet if people think I'm not a team player. And don't accept the hero for doing this all day. I don't know what hero was, and it's the highest paid person in the office. CEO or product manager or architect or team lead or anyone else that I think of a stupid idea and says don't do that. So what do you actually want? You want people here who are open to admitting weaknesses. There's no shame in saying I don't understand this or I don't know this. I'm not an expert in this aspect of code. If I mess up, I want to know my team are going to come to learn how to improve, not sort of say you're an idiot. Um, if you want to be able to speak up, so your concerns can be addressed, and you want to be able to believe in the product and in the vision of people on your team. So uh, we team share core values, core beliefs, so you understand the ideals, you understand the limits of what you do, you know who you should hire, who you should promote, you know what qualities you wouldn't hire for, and what you wouldn't sort of promote for, and you know what kind of workplace you want to create. So how do you do this? Well, five values as soon as you get a proper title, as soon as you're a senior developer, people watch what you do and they do what you do. So you can walk the walk and talk the talk. And I'm running out of time. So what should you hire for? So typically, you want to hire for cultural fit and not necessarily just competence. What tends to happen is people confuse these two concepts and they keep the ourselves and they try and people have good like cultural fit but aren't so good. You should be training them, bringing them to the point where they're a good cultural fit and they're a good
was our next John.